Welcome back to Open Line. We are talking with Vanderbilt Professor of History and Political Science, Dr. Thomas Swartz, all about politics, all about the state of our union. We just had the State of the Union. Donald Trump delivered it last week. And um, as we were talking on the break, every, I, I remember every president saying that he's required, it's a constitutional requirement to go in and give what is the State of the Union. They, it seems to me they always say the State of our Union is good, the State of our Union is strong. But you said there's one president who went in and, and said that it was not good. That's right. That's right. That was Gerald Ford. Um, he had just assumed the presidency in August of 74, uh, a very, very serious economic recession, the worst since World War II um, uh, hit in, in, the, in 73, 74 as a result of the oil crisis and, um, uh, po and just the, the, that, that, uh, the Mideast war and all the rest. And uh, things were bad. Things were not good. And he got up and I think um, he had a reputation for being a direct and honest figure. And I think this was a way he wanted to present um, the State of the Union. Uh, the, mm -hmm. and, and he did. Um, it, of course, uh, the problem was that the next year he had to say it was so much better <laughs> when it hadn't really gotten that much better. And then he got he lost. And I think the, the tradition of being honest about the State of the Union in terms of actually saying what's going on is sort of lost its steam since then. Because they're always going to say the State of the Union is strong. It's strong. When I'm president, it, it's got to be strong. And it's not required that the president deliver the State of the Union. That's right. It is required that they tell Congress what they believe the State of the Union is, but some presidents have sent someone else to do it or even a note, right? That's right, yeah. It, it goes back really to the early days of the Republic. Uh, Washington and Adams did do a State of the Union, but Jefferson thought that was too much like the king speaking, and Jefferson had a very strong anti-royalist and anti-monarchical view. He wanted to reduce the role of the presidency in that way, and so he simply sent a message. But that remained the tradition all the way through up until Woodrow Wilson. Um, and Woodrow Wilson, in a way, I think partly because of his own sense of the importance of the presidency in the, in the, Constitu in, in the Republic, wanted to highlight that role. And so he did it. And then his successors who were reacting against him stopped it again. Coolidge didn't uh, for a time. But then it got restored with Franklin Roosevelt and with um, uh, the idea of the presidency again as a crucial institution. Very interesting. I, I think that's all very interesting. Talk about Congress now. Um, control of Congress. Where, where, where do things stand now? Obviously, Republicans control it, but there's a, a major midterm election coming up. Yeah. Generally, the party that holds the presidency does not do as well in the midterm election. How do, how do you see things shaping up? Well, for a while, it looked very strongly like the blue wave was what was being said, namely that the, the Democrats would take both the House and the Senate. Public opinion polls showed overwhelming, a fairly strong gap, up to 17 points in the generic ballot. That has shifted a little, and you've had a, a, a decline in the, the degree of Republican uh, or Democratic advantage over the Republicans. Um, it, still is, uh, it still is a situation which we've had the last three presidents, um, uh, Barack Obama in 2010, or they also, uh, 2010, uh, George Bush in 2006 in the midterm, and he didn't, it didn't happen in 2002, which would have been sort of comparable because of 9-11 and the surge of support he got, but Bill Clinton in 94 that you have this reversal in that and uh, that the people tend to vote for the other party as a check on the president. So I think history would argue that the Republicans or that the Democrats are going to do very well. Whether they get full control, uh, that is not completely clear. They got a big victory the other day when the Supreme Court decided not to reverse Pennsylvania's order to redistrict, um, to, to redefine the districts in Pennsylvania in a more proportionate way. They, uh, the districts had been drawn in such a way that the Republicans were getting uh, additional seats beyond what their percentage of the vote would have called for. And so there are some who think that this is going to give the uh, Democrats a few extra seats in Pennsylvania. You look at some other places. The other thing that, of course, is going on is the number of Republican retirements. Yeah, a why, large number of why Republican is that? retirements. I, I have seen that. Do you think that means that they're concerned? It's hard to say. Um, the, some, of, some are naturally, they've been there for a while, all of that. Some may be, um, it, it may be a way of protesting that the party has moved into the Trump party and they don't feel as comfortable with that. Um, 
Some may be retiring as, as a couple of the California congressmen may be retiring because they are pretty much in danger given the strength of the Democrats in California. So th that's another thing that's going to hurt the, uh, the Republicans um, overall is that the, a lot of their incumbents are, are bowing out. So I think the House is still probably likely to switch. I think the Senate is much more problematic because the races really favor um, states where Donald Trump did very well. And it would take quite a shift. Um, and our, our own Senate race may be a very crucial one in that regard. What are you hearing as far as our, our Senate race? You're right, Alabama um, had an open seat. Certainly that's a pro-Trump state, and they had a Democrat. Right. Tennessee has an open seat because Corker is not going to run again. And that's certainly a pro-Trump state, but there's, there's a, a strong Democrat running, former governor. Um, Marshall Blackburn will likely could be the, the Republican nominee. That'll be a fascinating battle, but Democrats have hope. Democrats have hope. They're very energized in Tennessee. Um, this will be a case where they've got a really solid, co competent candidate. Um, something it may may also be related a little bit. We've got a Senate and a governor's race, so there might be also increased turnout, which could help the Democrats as well. So. It's, Tennessee could be very, very interesting. I bet you, I, I think, uh, I would be prepared to bet that there'll be more money in this race than we've ever seen in a Tennessee race, that the, the, between the Senate and governor's race, we will have nonstop political commercials. As you know, they've already started they have, um, yeah. with Bob Lee's commercials for the Republican and governor, and then there's some others as well. So, In the Democratic side, in both the House and Senate, what is their message? What is, what is their primary message, do you think? Is it just anti-Trump or, or do they have a, a, a message that will resonate? That I think that is I think one of the things that uh, the State of the Union after the State of the Union they had five different messages they had a Spanish message they had Joe Kennedy but they had also other other representatives giving talks as well and there is a real problem. I mean, a party in opposition has a problem without a, a set leader in having a single message. The Democrats have also moved considerably to the left in certain places. In California, the New York Times had a piece the other day about how much more to the left California has moved politically so that, um, you know, if you're a Democratic candidate there, you have to be for universal health care. You have to be for a whole set of, 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 of very expensive propositions without saying how you're going to pay for them. Um, the the problem is the Democrats are torn between a, a, a different factions, uh, a, a corporatist uh, wing, you might say, that's very close to a lot of the, the tech companies and others and wants to make sure that anything changes is, is good for business. You've got identity politics and different factions within the, the party, immigrants, uh, African Americans, uh, women, um, gay uh, rights groups. So, in a way, there's not a single coherent message, and that's when one of the things that have been argued about that the Democrats need. Uh, the single coherent message, the one that most people hear, is we don't like Trump and we want to impeach him. That may not be enough to get a, uh, to, to do, the, do the job, although it, it certainly will energize a lot of the base. And is there, is there a front runner for the leader of the party, the person who will likely be the Democratic nominee for president, um, you know, in, in, in two years, two and a half years or so, um, or maybe three years, whenever it's going to be, this next time, who is going to be the leader of the party to run um, when the next opportunity comes? Well, I think that's very hard to say. I mean, yeah. if there were a poll, probably Bernie Sanders might be ahead simply out of name recognition and the devotion of his followers. Um, but there's a, a, a strong set of candidates in the Senate. Uh, particularly Kamala Harris, for example, in California, Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts, um, uh, Cory Booker of New Jersey is an African-American candidate who's in some, some ways trying to, to imitate the Obama style. I think right now the Democrats don't have a set leader. In fact, their response at the, to the State of the Union, the person they selected was Joe Kennedy, who's a young congressman from Massachusetts and, of course, connected to the Kennedy uh, dynasty, but not, uh, obviously not presidential material yet. So they were really, in a way, they were hearkening to the past without really quite sure where they're going in the future. And uh, this is not unusual for a party out of power. Um, so I think Barack Obama only emerged really quite suddenly. and. Uh, uh, it's possible that uh, another candidate like that will come out. And Donald Trump kind of emerged. Yes, yeah. Suddenly. Let's go to Reverend Fuzz. Reverend Fuzz, how are you? Hey, good evening. It's always good to hear from you. What's on your mind? Uh, what, what do you think 
it's what? going to happen. And I just left city council. What, what do you think will be happening with our mayor? I uh, n noticed that a lot of the uh, problems that the hospital is having right now came out tonight. That her lack of leadership is the cause of that. That the six million dollars shortage that they're having is because of the uh, inappropriate way that she handled uh, setting up the investigation to shut down inpatient care. I'd like to hear your uh, expert's thoughts on what he feels ought to be happening in the city right now and does he feel the mayor can govern? Some people have said the mayor cannot uh, govern effectively. Uh, you saw the council last night overruled her proposal for $13 million to the hospital and actually gave them the 19 point six or seven that they asked for. Uh, do you feel people can trust or have confidence in this kind of leadership with all the debacles that's come out and and her visit to the churches on Sunday seeking prayer? I asked why not go to your own church or pray in your secret closet um, and uh, and and then forgiveness asking for forgiveness. Well then you know that there were three people, Judge Casey Moreland Councilman Lionel Green and uh, criminal clerk uh, David Torrance, that she went on television demanding that they step down, from the, that they resign in the interest of the public trust, and she comes to ask for forgiveness, which I don't say one way or the other. I'm just saying, is that a double standard? And what are some of your thoughts about that? I'm, I'll ask um, Dr. Swartz here. What are I, th I feel like I know your thoughts, but do you think she can govern? Are you saying you think she should step down at this point? Or what, what are you saying before I turn it over to Dr. Swartz here? Well, you, you know, when I feel like that the city at large is really at stake. There's a lot at stake here. And that she, I'm not judging her. I feel like she's got an opportunity to learn from this experience and be a great benefit to families and people, to the nation, but in her current position and what, the way people feel, I don't feel like that she could be the effective kind of head of our community that's really needed for this great city. This is an awesome city and what's going on. I feel like she's been compromised and that there's a symptom of poor leadership decisions that have been made by a mayor. It's not just a hospital, there are lots of things. Fort Negley, uh, the way that deal seems to have been made, uh, the board of YMCA, the way the community pushed back at that, and now transit on the table. We need a community who comes together and understands what our city is asking us to have taxes for. We don't know that transit will work, but I know education will work. I know health care will work, affordable housing. Housing, I've got people in my church having to move to Bowling Green and Clarksville because they can't afford to live in Nashville. Right. Housing will work. All right, well, let's, let's talk. Let's talk it over with Dr. Swartz. Reverend Fuzz, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a major council meeting tonight. I know you're focused more on national, even international, yeah. but boy. What happened in the last week or so with, with the mayor is it made national news. It made national news, yes. Um, what are your thoughts? What, what, what can you, uh, what wisdom can you give us? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I, I think this is one of those where I'd almost like to punt because I, uh, you know, I was a su surprised to see how this has all unfolded. Um, sitting back and, you know, just observing, I, it has struck me that what might have been simply a personal thing in the sense of admitting this affair and, and moving on has has snowballed and the the reverend's comments make me think that this is much more serious and that um, the tennesseans editorial which was very hard um, on the mayor and these are from people who are much more sympathetic and supporters so from that point of view i think uh, that certainly her situation is compromised among her supporters and that may make it very hard it, it is true of course we're in the middle of, of a very serious debate the transit the expense of transit and and all of this so with these types of issues ahead I, it, it does make me wonder whether um you know that in, in a way um she may it may it might have might advance the issues for her to step aside and someone else to to push them forward so i won't ask you now about 
Mayor Barry, but I mm -hmm. will ask, um, as, from your chair as a historian, political scientist, mm -hmm. somebody who follows politics, I was struck by how just remarkable her um, admission was. Uh, it's not something I remember seeing a lot. No. That someone, an elected official, would go and say, I made a mistake, I, I had an affair, and I'm asking for your apology. Right. Um, I think it is far more common for someone to say, um, nope, I didn't do it, you know, there's nothing here. Um, some might say something like fake news, I don't know, but there's, there's all of these ways of denying things. This was a remarkable admission. Have we seen anything like that? D did, you, did you see any historical um, uh, connection with, with what that admission was? Well, you know, you of course... <laughs> Uh, when a public figure gets up and is so direct, uh, you're reminded of public figures who were much more devious. Um, Bill Clinton's I never had sex with this woman sort of thing, very outspoken, direct, a lie. But it probably saved his presidency or at least bought him time and effort. So her admission and her direct uh, accounting should have, I, I thought, would have uh, soothed people more, but it didn't. Um, maybe that's partly because, of course, it wasn't with someone outside of government. It was with someone who traveled with her and involved the expense possibility of the abuse of public funds and this sort of thing, and it, that stirred up people. And it's clear there's some issues here, as the Reverend was talking about with the hospital, with others, which, which um, the, the idea is, is, has the mayor been leading? Um, or might this, the admission of an affair be an indication of of other faults or problems of leadership. Now, you know, given what Mayor Barry has been through personally with her son, it's kind of hard to, to, to be as judgmental, but it, it does seem like uh, there are tough political things going on here that um, she's facing, and it, uh, especially among people who seem to have been her supporters. And that's where I sort of find myself uh, seeing so many of her supporters uh, be as critical um, uh, makes me wonder whether she's got that political viability. It's interesting. Okay, again, we're mainly talking about national. Well, that says local, though, down there, but it's mainly national, I promise. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. 615-737 plus 615-737-7587. Uh, we'll take a break, continue our discussion right after this.